Hey guys, Taki here. I'm on a bit of a PlayStation kick lately, and I've realized that there are not a lot of handhelds out there that draw inspiration from PlayStation consoles or PlayStation handhelds. I have vivid memories of playing on my friend's PS1 back in 96, and I remember plowing through a ton of JRPGs when I finally got my own. The handheld that I'm reviewing today is not the only handheld that draws heavily on PS1 nostalgia, but it is by far the best. In this video, we will do a deep dive first look at this thing, and I'm gonna try and keep the runtime on this video down, but these things always seem to get away from me when I'm reviewing or showcasing a product that I enjoy. I think the first thing that we need to talk about is the design, because a lot of this will probably look very familiar to all of you watching. This is the third iteration of the original air design that was first teased last year. It's also the most radical change from the original design because a lot of the original marketing features of the air were scrapped for this one. You gotta give it to them for trying to push the needle with the original air, but the current battery and processor technology just isn't there. For this third revision, they've made four big changes that I think make this a realistic option for average users. The first is that we have a much better processor this time around. It's a bit older in April of 2023, but the 6800U is a huge leap from the older processors that were used in the Air and the Air Pro. This means that we can expect better performance at lower power consumption, and that's something that's very important when you have a device that is this small. The second big change that we have here is a huge bump to the battery spec. This thing comes with a 46.2 watt hour battery, which is a beast for a device of this size, but I kind of wish they went for broke and put something more absurd in here. I am personally ready for the Air Plus Traveler Edition with a 60 watt hour battery and a slightly thicker shell. The third change was to heat dissipation. We now have a bigger heat sink, thicker heat pipes, and a bigger fan that's rated for up to 28 watts of power. I have yet to push this thing that far in my pre-review testing, but I'm dying to see how it holds up. The last change is my personal favorite. This device bumps the older 5.5 inch OLED screen to a 6 inch IPS one. While on its face that might seem like a negative, this is a very good 6 inch panel that they grabbed for this one, and I plan to compare it directly to the handheld that you're probably thinking of right now. Aside from all of that, the only other thing that we have is this new color scheme. Without busting out the Pantone strips to see if this is an accurate shade of gray for an original PS1, which I could totally do if someone wanted, it at least seems to be very accurate, and I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. They scrapped some of the things that I didn't like about the original Air and the Air Pro color schemes and came up with this combination that feels less flashy than some of the wild options that are out there for the Air. This is one that I wouldn't feel strange rocking in public. It has some color accents, namely in the face buttons, but the entire thing is very subdued. Our front shell is a shade of light gray that's similar to what you'd see on an original PS1, and this color carries over to the bottom four input buttons and the shoulder button assembly. I'm not entirely sure where the back color was pulled from since it's a lot darker than the power button on a PS1, but I don't think it really matters. The buttons are largely the same as they were on the air, but I still want to talk about them. We have conductive rubber under the right face buttons and our D-pad. Both of these are good and I don't have any complaints. The four bottom buttons use clicky tactile switches, as do the two hockey buttons on the top. It's a minor improvement, but these bottom buttons are a bit easier to use than they were on the Air and the Air Pro. The press material states that the face buttons were also improved to make them softer, but I can't notice a difference if there is one. If anything, I would say the D-pad is a hair stiffer than it was in the review units of the other Air models. That leaves us with all of our Hall Effect buttons. R2 and L2 are great with a good amount of travel to them. If you're playing a racing game or something that can use analog values for input, these will allow you to get very precise input. The analog sticks are Joy-Con style sticks, but these also come with hall sensors. That just basically means that these use magnets for input and are marketed as not being susceptible to drift. I still have a ton of testing to do, but I anticipate that this is going to be my only criticism of this model. I wish they would have gone with a bigger analog part in this big redesign that they did. As you all know, Switch Joy-Cons are used in almost every emulation handheld, big or small, and they do work well in a variety of handhelds. Even the OLED Switch is bigger than this device, and it doesn't really have any issues, but you're not really playing the same kind of games that you can play on a PC handheld on the Switch. 
For a handheld like this, you really want bigger sticks to make it easier to play FPS games where precise input is key. Without them, you can really only rely on gyros, which is what the Switch leverages in games where Joy-Cons don't cut it. We do have gyros on this handheld, and they do work well, but there's nothing like getting a big joystick. You essentially have three main types of joysticks that you can use if you want to build a product like this. On the small end, you have Joy-Cons that are essentially just redesigned Vita analogs. Up from there, you have this joystick that is commonly used in RC cars or drones. This part is not that common in handhelds right now, but you can find it in the GBD Win 4, the GBD Win 3, and the GBD XP. I haven't done a teardown on it, so I can't be 100% sure, but I also think the unreleased Lenovo Legion handheld uses this part. And on the high end, we have big joysticks, like the ones used in the Steam Deck or Xbox and PlayStation controllers. I wish this redesign came with at least the middle joystick because it's a decent improvement over Joy-Cons even without Hall Effect sensors. When it comes to ergonomics, the Air Plus checks a lot of boxes for me. This thing is a little heavier than the older Air models, but that weight is spread out in a bigger shell. Because we have a huge battery in here, this device isn't perfectly balanced in the center, as all things should be, but it's not too far off center, and it's not something that I could notice while gaming. The additional shell thickness gives you a lot more heft in both of your hands, but the redesigned slope in the grip area is by far the MVP in terms of ergonomics. On this version of the device, I find that my middle finger rests in a far more comfortable position than it could on the other two Air models. I've invested a lot of time with the Air Pro, and this is something that was really obvious to me after the bump in screen size. Let's switch gears to talk about the screen. My first impressions after about 15 hours or so of gaming on this is that it's a really nice screen. It's a screen that I was aware of in the past, but I never had a chance to test it. I've only ever seen a data sheet for it. I'm low-key jealous that they were able to use this screen first because it's a really good screen and there are not that many good 6-inch screens on the market. With the addition of this device, we have a total of 4 current handhelds that use a 6-inch 1080p display. These would be the Odin and Odin Lite handhelds, the GBD Win 4, and this device. What I want to do now is do panel measurements across all four devices so we can see where the air lands. I don't know if it'll be the best in this group, but I think it will be near the top based on my subjective opinion. Because we have so many devices, I'm going about this a bit differently than I usually do, but the process and the methodology are the same. There are a ton of characteristics that can make a given screen better than another. Some of them are subjective, but a lot of the important ones are objective. For this comparison, we will focus on five key points. Refresh rate, brightness, sRGB gamut coverage, color temperature, and contrast ratio. Color temperature is the only thing on here that is subjective in nature, but when it goes too far to an extreme, it becomes objectively bad. Let's start with the Odin Light. This device has a 60 Hz refresh rate, 444 nits of peak brightness, 91.1% sRGB coverage, a color temperature of around 7000 Kelvin, and a contrast ratio of 1403 to 1. The Odin Pro is around the same, but it has higher brightness, better color accuracy, a better contrast ratio, and is a bit closer to my ideal when it comes to color temperature. Now let's do the Win 4. This is a device that I never ran any measurements on prior to this video. The Win 4 supports a refresh rate of 20 hertz all the way up to 78 hertz. That's something that is not that important on an Android handheld like Odin, but it is important on a PC handheld. For brightness, we're sitting a bit under my ideal of 400 nits, but it's not enough that you'd be able to tell by the naked eye. It does excel in sRGB coverage with a clear lead over the Odin handhelds, and the coverage was high enough that I also recorded the P3 color space coverage. When it comes to color temperature, that's really the only thing that's objectively bad when it comes to this screen, in my opinion. 11,000 Kelvin is very high for a screen, and it is not common by any stretch of the imagination. This results in a significant blue shift in the screen, but it's important to point out that you can get used to almost any color temperature if it's what you primarily use. Like if this is the only electronic device with a screen that you use, after a day or so, it will seem normal to you. Almost all of my devices sit between 7000 and 8000 Kelvin, so 11000 is not normal to me. Finally, we have a contrast ratio of 1072 to 1. That is more or less Steam Deck territory. 
An important thing to note is that you can customize the color temperature of a screen with Radeon settings, but that will come at the cost of color accuracy and brightness. If we do that on the Win 4, we jump down to 311 nits, lose about 5% color accuracy, and shave a bit off of our contrast ratio. Not ideal, but it does make the screen look a lot better. Now we have the Air Plus. This guy has a refresh rate of 45 hertz all the way up to 64 hertz. We essentially max out the sRGB gamut at 99.9%, .9%, so I shift it up to the P3 color space and we have a very nice 89% coverage. This was obvious to me right when I first powered on the device, and no matter what content you use this device for, you will notice the improvement. Our color temperature is also right in my sweet spot range, and this is actually a popular color temperature that is used as a standard in the market. The only real con is the contrast ratio, but it's not that obvious. Two points that I want to make from this. The colors in this chart don't have any meaning, so if something has a darker color, it doesn't mean that it's bad. The second thing is none of this takes into account how much power the panel consumes, and that is a very important detail for devices like these, especially when we're trying to get the most battery life possible. I can isolate some of this, but you really need specialized equipment to get accurate readings. If I end up seeing a big discrepancy between this and the Win 4 in the future, it will require further investigation. As I already said, this thing has a fan that is rated to cool up to 28 watts of power. I haven't checked to see if this is possible, but you might be able to use external software or some BIOS options to push this a bit further, but it's kind of wasteful to go that high on something like this. With the 6800U in a package this small, I'd really only use those higher TDP levels if I was connected to a wall outlet. If you run this off of a battery, the entire device can die in under an hour at 28 watt TDP, and there is zero chance for you to recharge in the same amount of time. I'll do more on power consumption in a later video, but I will say that I did test this at 28 watt TDP, and the fan had no problem keeping up. I've talked before about the default fan curve being too aggressive on IA devices in the past, but we now have the ability to create our own custom fan curves, and that's what I decided to do with this one. This is what the fan sounds like by default with a 15 watt TDP cap. Basically, what I wanted to do was find the quietest fan setting that could support 15 watt TDP since I know that that is what I will use most of the time when I'm on battery power. I then locked the fan speed to that maximum value and gamed for a while to test out the thermals. This is how the whole thing sounds using that change. The result is a CPU temp that sits under 70 Celsius for the most part, and a device that is very quiet to use. Using this profile, the fan is at 2900 RPM, but it would be over 4000 RPM using the stock hardware curves for a difference of only 8 Celsius. Even though those fan speeds don't seem that far apart, there is a big ramp up in terms of noise. I'll cover more on this topic in another video. Now I want to start doing some game performance tests on this, and you can see all of the relevant spec information on screen now for the device that I'm using. For the titles that I'm testing, I am targeting 720p or 1080p resolution depending on how much power the game requires to run. I'm also trying to run them at reasonable TDP levels. Let's kick things off at 5 watt TDP. This is the lowest supported TDP in the ISBase software, but it's enough power to play 2D titles. After 5 watt TDP, the next range that opens up more doors is 8 watt TDP, but I opted to use 10 watt since it's a default option in the ISBase software.
time to collect. Now we get to my preferred TDP with a product of this size. Here are a collection of titles at 15 watt TDP. In some cases, you can go lower than 15 watt to play these titles, but this is a safe, set it and forget it option. We are the employee housing district where they put you when your parents work for Shinra. While their reactors were slowly killing the planet, we were living the good life. You gotta be shitting me. <laughs> Give me a bit more time and I got you. Okay, if I want to learn more about how this demon... a cinch. For this last group of titles, I am using the 45 hertz refresh rate option on the device and I'm capping the FPS of the games that I'm playing to save on resources. I started at 15 watt TDP for these titles and only went to 20 watt TDP if the game could not run well. 20 watt TDP was the highest setting that I needed to use for the games in this section, even though the device can run at 28 watts without issues. Mr. Muggins, uh, if this is about the rent. Mr. Parker, this call serves as your third and final one. The picture proceeding. Only clever, and often too clever by half. So what'd you do to get Odin so mad at you?
We're out front, Bug. Member, reservations in your name, Ramon. Excuse me? Ah, you are here to see Taki-san. Am I right? Please, accept my apologies for the confusion. That's going to wrap up things on this first look at the Aya Neo Air Plus. This thing is now on IGG with a lot of different options available. I tested the flagship version in this video, but a lot of what I covered here applies to the other models as well since the parts are shared between them. I have some more videos planned on this one, so if you have any questions or anything else that you want me to cover next, feel free to leave those down below. Happy gaming everyone, Takiao.